do you think? How can religions work together for peace? First of all, religions must work together for peace if they are to be true to their metier, to the ideals that every religion espouse. If you say you believe in the dignity of the human person, in the sanctity of life, in justice and righteousness, and all the religions do, then if you don't work together with those that share those values, then you're not being true to those values. You're letting them down. We have an obligation to be greater than the sum of our different parts. But religion, above all, touches the deepest, most dimensions of the human spirit and soul. And therefore, religion has the power to make the connections that no other force within society can in the same way. This is the enormous resource that politicians and diplomats need to capitalize on. Yes, it's a responsibility of religious leaders and communities, but they will be able to do so far more effectively if politicians and diplomats and those involved in society at large and civil society engage these resources within religion. And that, I think, is the significance of this meeting. How does your work help to build peace in your country? Or in your country? Well, I'm a professional peacemaker. Uh, I'm a professional interreligious activist. That's what I do all the time. I hope I'm making a difference. I'm having a lot of fun, and that's, of course, important too. Um, and, but I would seriously point out to the fact that never in the history of humankind has there been more interreligious cooperation and collaboration than there is today. We, we all know the difference between the optimist and the pessimist, but why does the pessimist see the glass as half empty? And why does the optimist see it as half full? The pessimist is the unrealistic one. He comes on from on top and he sees everything that's missing, so he's disappointed. The optimist comes from underneath, he knows the glass was empty, therefore he can see everything that's in there and therefore he can celebrate. When we recognize a terrible history we have, humanity generally of the way we've behaved towards one another, and religions together are part and parcel of that tragic history. And where we are today, how can you but not celebrate the achievements of the modern era and be optimistic about the future cooperation between religions? So you're an optimist? Unquestionably. That. And I would say anybody who knows history should be an optimist. What do you think about the Foreign Officers Initiative to uh, cope with the responsibility of religions? So this initiative is really important because, first and foremost, religions are a resource. If you do not capitalize on that in humanitarian work, in terms of environmental work, in terms of social cohesion, all those areas, you are not functioning well as a political and diplomatic entity. So it's an obvious necessity. It's amazing that people haven't done this before, but it should be, it's an immediate necessity. In addition to that, Political and diplomatic authorities can empower religious communities by giving them greater visibility. And that's what's really important. So this, on both scores, is a very blessed initiative. You met a lot of people while being a peacemaker, a peace builder. And um, is there maybe a special moment or um, maybe more special moments you remember which were very encouraging for you to keep on going? Well, there have been so many. I was a young rabbi in South Africa at the heart of apartheid. In the end, the government got rid of me. But it's in these places of where there are terrible things that you see some of the most wonderful, inspiring things. And the relationships from that time were a great blessing to me. And it started me on my interfaith direction. I came into interfaith relations out of a commitment to social justice. And then I realized how important it was. And there were encounters of various kinds. And then I was chief rabbi of Ireland. Um, in, in Ireland, you could also see the way that religion had been abused but was transformed. There were also many moments. I'm not sure there's any one specific incident I can point to. My life, thank God, is blessed with these moments. Um, what have been the biggest challenges, maybe, for you? So there are internal and external challenges. If I talk now as an Orthodox rabbi and as an Israeli, I would say the biggest external challenge is the amount of poison and hatred that has come about in my region as a result of the Israeli-Arab conflict. And having to automatically try to overcome that in any kind of Jewish-Muslim or Israeli-Arab engagement is always a significant challenge, the most difficult challenge, but a challenge that can be overcome. The internal challenge is, has to do with what I would call in Jewish insecurities. Um, Jewish insecurities and traumas are very profound, with good reason. You know the joke. Just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not trying to kill me. So we've got good reason to be paranoid, but paranoia tends to lead to insularity 
and tends to lead to a certain suspicion, if not fear, of those outside. And very often, I have to battle with my own colleagues to persuade them of the importance of this particular engagement. But I can say that it's getting easier and easier each day. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Maybe if you want to, um, you can I know, you're good to message. To, to humanity? Yeah, to humanity, to peace. But wait this a camera. second and this camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I'm asked to highlight what I think is the most important biblical teaching, I would say it is that every human being is created in the divine image. If we can see every human person whom we encounter, even if we don't like them, as nevertheless endowed with that divine character, then we can overcome those prejudices and those challenges and create a world in which we truly live with full human flourishing, respect and dignity.